In this video, we're going to talk about the vertical position of the central incisor in the face of the patient. Treatment planning is mainly about conceptual thinking. It's about imagining where would be the ideal positions of teeth in the patient's face even before we start the treatment. If you would ask me what was the most important factor designing these smiles, I would say it was the three-dimensional positioning of the central incisor according to the face of the patient. Positioning the central incisor according to the face of the patient is considered by the vast majority of experts in treatment planning as the starting point both from an aesthetic and also from a functional perspective. A distinction that is important to be made at this point is the difference between macroaesthetics and microaesthetics. It comes down to this. Macroaesthetics should always be attended before we even think about microaesthetics. If we don't deal with factors such as the incise latch positioning and the gingiva levels, if we don't deal with these sorts of factors in the first place, what may happen is that we may end up with teeth that look very good on a close-up picture with very good tooth shape, very good texture, but that they don't make sense in the patient's face, which is, of course, the most important thing. We want to look at the patient from a social perspective, from a social view, from a social context. That is much more important than looking at the picture showing the six anterior teeth. And here, I always try to consider two different scenarios. The first one is the patient where we have complete aesthetic freedom. This is a typical patient, for example, an edentulous patient or a patient who is about to become edentulous. The other scenario is a situation where the aesthetic freedom is limited by the existing dentition that we want to maintain or do some sort of limited changes. Even though these are two different scenarios, the thought process for treatment planning is the same either you have or you don't have any remaining dentition. When you don't have any remaining dentition, you would have to be imagining where the ideal positions of these teeth should be in the patient's face. If you have the remaining dentition, you would be thinking about which sorts of transformations should this dentition undergo in order to get that ideal result. And these transformations, we are talking about shape transformations, both in hard tissues and in soft tissues. We are talking about movement transformations, all the sort of transformations that you would need to get that final result. But the thought process of reaching the final result should be the same. In this video, we are gonna focus on one of the three factors of the 3D positioning of the central incisor. And that is the factor where I believe most of the errors are made, which is the vertical positioning of the central incisor in the face of the patient. When we are thinking about the vertical position of the central incisor, we are thinking about two things. We are thinking about the incisor less position and also the gingival levels. And when we define these two, we are defining not only their vertical position, but also the tooth size. Now for the incise ledge position, we have to consider the patient at rest with the upper lip at rest so that you can see the relation between the incise ledge position and the vertical position of the upper lip at rest. If we gather the data from different studies and we try to organize it into this sort of a table, we can see that for each decade that goes by, we tend to show one millimeter less of the incisor ledge display. Now, men for the same group of age, they show on average one millimeter less than women for the same age. The evaluation of a proposed of a new incisor ledge position for a specific patient can be done on wax rims if it is an edentulous patient, can be done with direct or indirect mock-ups, can be done with tooth setups. So either we are talking about full dangers or composite restorations or veneers, 
we need to find a strategy so that we can evaluate that new incisal alleged position. So how do we ask a patient to go to the position where we can actually evaluate the incisal alleged position at rest? Well, it, this may seem easy, but it's not that linear because patients, when they are in the dental office, what happens is that they become nervous and the position of their upper lip is rarely a relaxed position. One of the ways that I find most useful is to ask the patient to close their eyes and open their mouth without smiling. Then I go there and I do some movements on the upper lip to remove any remaining tension. And once the patient is in that position, I ask them to open their eyes without any sort of movement. And I can usually get a video or a picture that can really show me the position of the upper lip at rest and that relation with the incisal edge display. And of course, there is still some discussion whether we should be using more of a mechanical approach in terms of specific numbers or we should be going more for a customized and subjective approach to aesthetics? Well, my answer to that is that both philosophies are, of course, correct. But you need a place to start. You need a place where you can initiate your treatment planning. So I use these numbers as starting points. These are starting points that we are going to test in the patient's face and see more or less if that is what the patient is looking for. So you use more of a quantified approach as a place to start, and then you try to integrate that in the patient's face, in the patient's desire, in the patient's personality, if you want to call it. Now we are going to define the gingival level. And once we have defined the inside ledge position and the new gingival level, we will be basically be defining the vertical position of the new central incisor. And of course, also, as we said before, the tooth size. And again, there are a few factors that we need to consider when we are establishing the new gingival level. One of the most obvious ones is, of course, the average of the tooth size. And we know that in women, for example, the average tooth size is about 9 and 10. And in men, the tooth size, the average would be between 10 and 11. Another fundamental factor would be, of course, the amount of gingival exposure during the smile. And that amount of gingival exposure would be defined, of course, number one, by the dynamic position of the upper lip during the smile, and by the gingival levels, which would be the transition between the white aesthetics and the pink aesthetics. Again, classical studies like the study from Kokish, for example, it shows us that people, they tend to evaluate negatively patients that show more than three millimeters of gingival display during the smile. But I think that you will agree with me that even though these studies, they show that gingival displays of up to three millimeters, they can be acceptable. I think that you agree with me that patients, especially after a certain group age, they tend not to accept very well gingival displays more than zero to one millimeter. So when I am trying to do treatment planning, my aim would be to get a gingival display between zero and one millimeter. And that means that during a natural smile, the patient would not be showing much more soft tissue than actually the papilla. And one of the most undervaluated factors when we try to consider the vertical position of the central incisor in the face is actually the size of the upper lip at rest. We know that the average size of the upper lip is about 20 millimeters in a woman and about 22 millimeters in men. And there's a variability of about more or less two millimeters. And we also know that the mobility is about 30%. Now, just for the fun of this, let's consider different numbers gathered from different studies and see how this all makes sense. To do this, let's consider a 30-year-old female. She has a 10 millimeter long central incisor. When she is at rest, what the studies tell us 
is that she shows about three millimeters of the upper incisor, which means that the upper lip is covering about seven millimeters of the central incisor. We also know that the average upper lip size at rest is about 21 millimeter, let's say it for a female. And she has about 30% of mobility, which means that 30% of 21 is about seven millimeters. Now, if we start with the upper lip at rest at three millimeters from the incisal edge, if the upper lip moves about seven millimeters, it will stop exactly at zero millimeters in terms of gingival display. Now you can see that all these numbers, when you try to integrate them, they actually make a lot of sense. This animation shows us what we have talked in the beginning which is that with age, we show less of the upper incisors at rest. And by the way, we show more of the lower incisors at rest. The problem is that these numbers that we talk so far, they are averages, but there is a wide variation within the population. So these averages, they do not reflect the vast majority of the population. One of the most important articles that was published in 2017 about treatment planning was the article The Lip Factor. And Kyle Stanley in this article, he talks about a plastic surgery procedure that is called the lip lifting. And what this procedure basically does, it reduces the upper lip size at rest in such a way that it can help dentists increase the upper incisal edge at rest without excessively increasing the size of upper teeth. Because in some situations, especially in older patients, if you want to increase the upper incisal edge display during rest, which means we want to make them look younger, because the lip is so long that in order to do so, we may eventually end up with teeth that are too big, and that can be not only a static problem when the patient smiles, but also a functional problem in terms of the interior guidance. And this article brought the attention for the dental community. We can actually advise our patients to change the lip size at rest, but more important than that, shows us how limiting upper lip size can be for any sort of aesthetic rehabilitation. Now, just a short note here. I don't want you to be making any confusion between this plastic surgery procedure, which is lip lifting, and some other aesthetic procedures like the Botox and lip repositioning. Both Botox and lip repositioning are indicated in gummy smiles patients. This is a completely different story. This is lip lifting. This is something to help dentists help their patients show more of the upper teeth without having to excessively increase the size of the upper teeth. In this table, what I have done, I have basically added the lip size as another factor to consider when we are deciding the upper incisal display at rest. Which means, again, for example, for a 30-year-old female, we would be thinking about three millimeters of the incisal edge display at rest. But if this patient has a very long upper lip, I would probably be considering reducing that estimated three millimeters because otherwise the teeth may be looking excessively long, especially when that upper lip starts to move. So the lip size is probably more important than the patient age when we are considering the upper incisal edge at rest. This is something that we should be thinking about. So the lip size is probably more important than actually the age of the patient when we decide how much display at rest this patient needs to have. Let's see now how we connect all these dots. We use a process that we call dental-gingival labial dynamics. This integrates most of the factors that we have talked so far. 
like the incisal edge display, the tooth size, the lip mobility, the lip size, the gingival display, and we integrate all this with the opinions of several experts so that we can formulate a thought process that can help the clinician make decisions. Now, from a dynamic point of view, the starting point would be the age, the sex, of course, and the lip size during rest position. That will provide us with a suggestive incisal edge position. Now, when the upper lip moves, then we are talking about the gingival position, the gingival levels. And that gingival level will be dictated by the position of the upper lip during the smile and also by what we consider to be an average tooth size. Of course, that if we think about a patient where we do not have that much aesthetic freedom, like for example, a patient where we are considering some crown lengthening procedure, we should also be thinking about the bone positioning and the CJ position so that we can see what would be the best solution for this patient. Regarding expert opinions on this matter, one of the most important things that we learn with Frank Spear, and by the way, Frank Spear is, in my opinion, one of the most influential thinkers in terms of treatment planning, is the fact that the position of the upper lip during the smile is of highly influence to the overall vertical position of the central incisor. This means that the upper lip does not only influence the gingival level, but actually it influences the whole position of the central incisor, including the incisal edge position. In order to understand this concept, let's think about a patient where, because of the lip size and the age and the sex, we have decided to go for a three millimeter incisal edge display at rest, the typical 30 year old female. Now, if you ask this patient to smile, one of three things may happen. Number one, when the patient smiles, the upper lip stops exactly at the gingival level. Here, seeing about a zero millimeter of gingival display, only showing the papilla, which, as we have talked before, is quite acceptable for most of the patients. So in this situation, we would be accepting our three millimeter of incisal edge display at rest because with 10 millimeter long teeth, we would be having the upper lip stopping exactly where we wanted it to stop. The other situation would be the same patient where we have decided again to go for the three millimeter of incisal edge display. But then when she smiles, she moves in such a way that the upper lip moves about 10 or 11 millimeters. This means that for a 10 millimeter long tooth, we would be showing about three to four millimeters of gingival display, which is again not acceptable for most of the patients. So if we want to maintain an average tooth size, if we don't want to have a 14 or a 15 millimeter long central incisor, which certainly we do not, what we have to do is that we have to abdicate of the incisal edge display at rest and move the whole tooth upward so that when the patient smiles, she is not showing so much of the gum tissue. So basically what we are doing is that we are abdicating from the incisal edge display at rest in order to avoid a gummy smile. And our third situation, a patient where we have the same exact initial situation and we have decided to go for a three millimeter incisal edge display because of the age, of the sex and the lip size. But then when this patient smiles, the upper lip almost does not move. This means that when this patient tries to smile, she almost does not show anything of the tooth itself. She only shows, she barely shows more than the teeth that she was already showing at rest. And in this situation, what we have to do is that we have to potentiate the incisal edge display at rest. Remember that here we are changing the incisal edge displays at rest, as Frank Spear told us, 
because of the mobility of the upper lip. Because we know that there is a lot of variability in the incised alleged display at rest. And we also know, as we have discussed before, that patients, they do not accept very well gummy smiles. Not only they don't accept gummy smiles, but they don't also accept the fact that when they smile, they don't show a large portion of their teeth. So as a takeaway, first of all, you define the incisal edge position. Remember, this is a suggested incisal edge position. Number two, you evaluate the lip movement. And the lip movement may be okay, may be too much, or may be too little. And because of that, you would have to place the whole tooth accordingly to that, which means that your suggested incisal edge position may need to be changed so that you can move the whole tooth up or the whole tooth down to maintain what we consider to be an average tooth size and avoid a gummy smile and make sure that the patient shows quite a lot of teeth when they are smiling. Remember that in the beginning I told that we may be able to do this if we have complete aesthetic freedom or if we have limited aesthetic freedom. Of course, these changes, they are easy to do if, for example, you are doing a full denture because you can basically have more freedom to place the whole tooth up or the whole tooth down. Now, most patients, they have an existing dentition, so you don't have that much aesthetic freedom. Now, for these patients, the thought process even still is the same. You have to think what would be the ideal position of teeth according to this phase and see which sorts of transformations and think about which sorts of transformations would be reasonable to do to transform this existing dentition into that ideal positioning according to this specific patient. And of course that we are thinking about changes in terms of shape of hard tissues and soft tissues and also in terms of movement. So we are thinking about maybe restorations, composite restorations, we are talking maybe about veneers or some other sorts of restorations. We are talking about orthodontics. We are talking about periodontal surgery. It really doesn't matter. As long as you do this exercise of projecting from the existing situation into the ideal one and try to think backwards, what would we need to do in this dentition to reach that goal? So I hope that all the ideas and thoughts that were shared throughout this video will make you more aware of the importance that facial aesthetics have on aesthetic, restorative and interdisciplinary dentistry. We need to think more and more in terms of faces, in terms of lip sizes, lip mobilities, gummy smiles, different causes of gummy smiles, and think of this in a truly interdisciplinary way. Because I think that you will agree with me that this makes dentistry much more interesting and much more exciting.